be holy without fault. The NIV says holy and blameless in his sight. And it's true, isn't it? I'm sure I'm not the only one. In our 21st century UK context, somehow the later part of this verse, this is verse 4, can feel a little harder to swallow. Oh, this is sounding strange, isn't it? Shall I move? Or oh, is it okay? Yeah. So, <laughs> the later part of the verse, to be holy and blameless in his sight, somehow feels just a little bit more uncomfortable to read than the first part of being loved, being chosen, being adopted. <laughs> These are just all, you know, such wonderful things. But I want to suggest to us that every part of this verse <laughs> is as truthful and life-changing and powerful as every other part. The impact of truly understanding what it means and what it does to us when God says, I see you as holy and blameless in my sight is as life-transforming as everything else that we have just soaked in in the previous session. Sometimes we misunderstand the word holy. It can make people feel very uncomfortable for all kinds of different reasons. Perhaps feelings of being judged or a sense of never reaching unattainable standards. Or perhaps, and I think this is, uh, I think this is very real, the word has become redefined by our culture to mean something repressive, uptight, no fun, and actually not very attractive. And so Christians have actually taken on that more recent cultural definition of holiness rather than the biblical definition of holiness and perhaps thought, well, I'm not really sure I want that anyway. I do believe that the enemy loves to distort our understanding of holiness because it is such a key to God's dream for our lives. There's an active agenda that's going on. And perhaps we struggle to swallow the whole bit of being holy and blameless in God's sight because we feel we should not call ourselves something that only God is. So there could be all kinds of different reasons as to why we perhaps don't read the second part of that verse with quite the same gladness that we read the first part. So let's explore it a little. The word holy means to be whole, means to be clean means to be set apart and different. The English word holy derives from the Old English word hallig, which itself comes from the German heilig, which means happiness and wholeness. C.S. Lewis says, how little people know who think that holiness is dull. When one meets the real thing, it is irresistible. That's what we need to get a hold of. In the Old Testament, the word for holy appears over 850 times. In the New Testament, it's over 150 times. So it's a central concept of the Bible, of the big story of God. <coughs> the Greek in New Testament, hagios, means this word separate, dedicated or consecrated to God. So what's really important when we understand what it is when God is calling us to holiness, Holiness is located first in describing who God is. <clears throat> and what's also really important for us to understand, it describes the whole of the Trinity. So let me just unpack that. That means that God the Father is gloriously, beautifully holy, always surrounded by light. That's, you know, whenever we read descriptions of God and the throne room, there's always so much light. God the Father is the source of everything that is good and right and pure and beautiful and lovely. And his glory, we, we, we often, don't we, those because we're kind of Holy Spirit people, aren't we? We long for the physical manifestation of the glory of God. And actually the glory of God is the physical manifestation of God's holiness. It's the practical outworking. God's glory is the manifestation of the attribute of holiness. So God the Father, we know God the Father is holy. We know that God the Son showed us holiness outworked in our human time space framework as being the most fully alive human being who has ever walked the planet. 
so kind, so compassionate, so joyful, challenging at times, full of grace and full of truth. I think the woman caught in adultery. You know, very cleverly, we don't know what he wrote in the sand. Was it the names of the Pharisees' mistresses? We don't know. Was it the hidden sins? We don't know. But whatever Jesus wrote, it took the attention off of the woman. And one by one, the older ones, interestingly, left first until there's no one left. Jesus looks at her, I think with much tenderness in his eyes, and says, has no one condemned you? She says, no one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. He's basically saying, you deserve so much more than this. You are a precious daughter of the King of Kings. So there we see Jesus, the Holy One, full of grace and full of truth. And then God, the Holy Spirit, well, the clue's in the name. And we love the Holy Spirit in Pioneer, don't we? <laughs> so if you need any reframing in your mind to see holiness as the beautiful thing it is, then just think about your friends, the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do in our lives? Brings freedom, brings life, brings power, brings joy. Think about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Again, that's a great description of what holiness looks like in a person who's full of the Spirit. They are being shaped by more and more, by love, more love. They're, as, as someone who's filled with the Spirit, as they go on in life, their heart gets bigger and bigger with a capacity to love God more and love others more. <coughs> I do believe at the very end of our lives when we see Jesus, you know, two of the key questions will be, how well did you love me and how well did you love others? So when we're full of the Holy Spirit, we become more loving. There's more joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. That's what holiness looks like, a life full of those things. So holiness is a very, very good and a very, very beautiful thing. And it's something that we are because we are in Christ. That's what's really important. It's something that is like our standing, but then it's something that we grow in. I do believe holiness is what humanity is de designed for. Jesus Christ is the most holy person and therefore the most human person who has ever walked the planet. And the more Christ-like we become, the more holy we become, and the more human we become. There's a quote here that I love. The greatest saints of God have been characterized not by halos and distant approachability, but by their humanity. They have been intensely human and lovable people with a twinkle in their eye. And I, something to do with this light, you see. There's something about holiness and light I do think that, that as people go on in life, those who choose to open themselves up more and more and more to the love and the beauty and the holiness of God, there will actually be more light that is coming from them. And do you know what I mean by sometimes people who are right towards the end of their life? It's like their eyes are shining bright. It's like they, are, they really are twinkling. There's, there's something so glorious because they... And those people, I think, oh my gosh, you would have had to have worked so hard throughout the whole of your lives to not hold on to offence, to have forgiven over and over and over again, to have been someone who has readily and quickly repented over and over and over again. And you see then, you see what it looks like when someone is full of the light and the glory of God. That's holiness. So to be holy is to be full alive and following our heart's desire to love and follow God. And I do believe holiness is every Christian's calling. And deep down is what we know we are created for. The reality is that sin robs us of our humanity and our calling. It's why 
you know, it destroys us and disfigures us. It's why God hates it so much and the enemy loves it so much. I remember Lawrence Singlehurst once describing sin as chocolate-covered cowpats. <laughs> Which stuck in my mind. Maybe it will stick in your mind because it's such a bizarre image. <laughs> but basically he was saying that the enemy tries to make sin look as attractive as possible. But then it's only once we kind of get into it we realise this is poison. So sin is not wrong just because it's wrong, it's wrong because it wrecks us. And unless we have an understanding of this, if we get robbed of this understanding, it ends up actually nullifying the work of the cross. It's why Jesus had to die. Humanity was wrecked. And Jesus drank the poison on the cross. And when that happened, there was a divine exchange. I love this picture of a divine exchange, where basically the filthy rags that we were wearing we exchange them for a divine robe of righteousness. I love that. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of Christ. That is the most incredible truth. Divine exchange. Everything, everything that, that we've ever done, said, thought that is ugly, it's filthy, gets exchanged and we get this robe of righteousness, cleansed from top to bottom. Everything has been removed that might hinder us from approaching the throne of grace with boldness and confidence. That's why, you know, Romans 8 verse 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's because when we approach the throne of grace, God sees his son. We are in Christ. He sees the robe of righteousness all over us. We're children of another dimension. So to be holy and blameless in his sight, it's a bit like beauty being in the eye of the beholder, in his sight, in God's sight. He sees us and he sees beauty. He sees holiness, he sees righteousness. Because it's almost like we're tucked into the cloak of the righteousness of Christ. So being holy and righteous and blameless is a conditional thing based, sorry, it's not a conditional thing based on being really good. It's a positional thing. That's a very important distinction. <laughs> very important. Not conditional. It's positional. It's because we're positioned in Christ, in the heavenly realm. So we don't get holy and then get God. We get God and then we get holy. We can't earn our way into it. We accept it and then we enjoy it. So does that mean we can carry on doing whatever we like because we're hidden in Christ? Well, of course not. That's, you know, again, you know, we've got, you know, Paul talks about, you know, does that mean I can just carry on, you know, sinning more and more because forgiveness is always available? The strange thing is, is I believe the more we get a revelation of what it means to be covered in the cloak of righteousness, the more we have a desire to want to live lives worthy of that calling. The more it's like the Holy Spirit sharpens our conscience because we can see who we are. And therefore we want to act up. So who we are, if we see ourselves right, we will act right. That's such a truth. If we see ourselves right, we will act right. So it comes back to what we were talking about before. Our primary identity as being loved, chosen and adopted. Oh, wow. We are sons and daughters of the living King. And when you truly know you are a son or a daughter of the living King, the king of all kings, the lord of all lords, it changes how we act. It changes how we operate. It's like we are those who straddle these two dimensions of heaven and earth, seated in the heavenly realms, another verse in Ephesians 2 verse 6, and yet we're rooted in this world that God loves. So we see ourselves as royal representatives of the culture of heaven, this place of glory and holiness and beauty and purity and life and love and freedom. It's like we're straddling the two. You know, again, C.S. Lewis 
the children of Narnia, when they were there in Narnia, they were kings and queens of Narnia. And there's a sense in which we are kings and queens. And we have to keep on helping our minds shift up to recognize that sense of royalty. You know, I, I do believe that if we can see ourselves right, if we can see ourselves as clothed in righteousness, royalty, it does really begin to change how we think, how we act, how we speak. It actually affects every area of our lives. We represent the culture of heaven on earth, knowing that one day the two will come together, and therefore we live differently. We live a life worthy of the calling. We live at times kind of as though we're there. Sometimes I picture myself, you know, the woman that I will be, fully redeemed, without, without any blemish, noble, radiant, shining with glory and light. And I sometimes picture myself and I say, Lord, I kind of want to live as much as the person I'm going to be for the majority of my existence. Here and now. Sometimes I, I think when we're just going around our everyday business, maybe, you know, at work, in the home, picking up kids from school, the angelic realm are seeing us, Jesus followers, clothed in righteousness. And going, wow, look, there's another one, there's another one. We're called to stand out, to shine out. And as the church outworks a lifestyle full of the Holy Spirit, it changes everything. I'm fascinated. There's a letter that was written by somebody called, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this right, Diagnetus? A hundred <laughs> um, AD. So written a hundred years after Jesus lived. And it showed the lifestyle that Jesus had called all his followers to live when he walked planet Earth, um, hadn't changed. So let me just read to you the, just the beginning of the letter. This is, this is what this, this is. This is 100 years on, okay, from when Jesus kind of launched the church. Christians are indistingu indistinguishable from other men, either by nationality, language, or customs. They do not inhabit, inhabit separate cities of their own or speak a strange dialect or follow some outlandish way of life. Their teaching is not uh, inspired by the curiosity of men. Unlike some other people, they champion no purely human doctrine. With regard to dress, food, manner of life in general, they follow the customs of whatever city they happen to be living in, whether it is Greek or foreign. And yet, there is something extraordinary about their lives. They live in their own countries as though they were only passing through. They play their role as full citizens, but labor under all the disabilities of aliens. Any country can be their homeland, but for them, their homeland, wherever it may be, is a foreign country. Like others, they marry and have children, but they do not expose them. They share their meals, but not their wives. They live in the flesh, but they are not governed by the desires of the flesh. They pass their days upon earth, but are citizens of heaven. Obedient to the laws, they yet live on a level that transcends the law. Christians love all men, but all men persecute them. Condemned because they are not understood, they are put to death but raised to life again. They live in poverty but enrich many. They are totally destitute but possess an abundance of everything. They suffer dishonour but that is their glory. They are defamed but vindicated. A blessing is their answer to abuse. Defense, their response to insult. Sorry, deference, their response to insult. For the good they do, they receive punishment. But even then, they rejoice as they're receiving the gift of life. They are attacked, but no one can explain the reason for this hatred. I know it's quite, it's quite challenging, but it's fascinating that, you know, a hundred years on, there's something about these Christ followers that are living to a different tune. They're living to the heaven's tune, heaven's rhythm. 
Tim Keller reflecting on the letter writes, the early church was strikingly different from the culture around it in this way. The pagan society was stingy with its money and promiscuous with its body. A pagan gave nobody their money and practically everybody their, everybody their body. And the Christians came along and gave practically nobody their body and gave practically everybody their money. Fascinating. And of course, that's the direct outworking then of what Ephesians goes on to describe. So we're called to be holy and blameless in his sight. And then further on, chapter 5, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, an aroma to God. So let there be no sexual immorality, impurity or greed among you. Such things have no place amongst God's people. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of the light. For this light within you produces what is good and right and true. And as the world gets darker, we need the people of God to be shining brighter and brighter and brighter, which is why we need more of the Holy Spirit. And what we've seen in Asprey, and other outpourings of the Spirit, as we pray for more of the Holy Spirit to come and fill us and shape us and make us and mold us, there, what happens is the things that we used to be able to get away with, it's like the Holy Spirit comes and says, uh-uh, that doesn't fit with who you are anymore. So there's something that happens as we get filled with the Spirit, our self-perception shifts, we begin to see, I'm clothed in righteousness. I'm a son or daughter of the King of Kings. Like I'm holy and blameless in his sight. There's something that begins to happen of like, oh, that doesn't fit with who I am anymore. That, that, oh, that's just, that's a bit out of kilter. That's a bit ugly for the, for the beautiful life that I'm called to live. For the beautiful story that I'm called to be part of. And uh, what's interesting with that, any human manufacturing, Asprey began to see young adults confessing sin. Nobody was saying you've got to do it. And I find that fascinating. And so often in terms of moves of the Spirit, whenever we start praying for God to move, for an awakening, whenever we start praying, God, would you visit us once again? Time and time and time again. It's like people just then spontaneously begin to go, oh, I want to get rid of this. I want to confess it out. I don't want this to be part of my life anymore. So repentance, surrender, obedience. So I just want to uh, land this session by reading a story, which actually has got some similarities to the one that, that Rich read. And I kind of thought, shall I go with this? And I thought, well, maybe there's something where God... You know when God wants to do something, there can be almost like repeated patterns and themes. I think that's what's going on. Because I do believe he wants us as his church, who are loved and chosen and adopted, <coughs> to be full of the light and the glory and the beauty and the brilliance and the holiness <coughs> of God. So why don't you close your eyes while I read this? The room was cold, dark, and damp, but it had become my friend, for I had lived there ever since I remembered. Heavy blankets of isolation, loneliness, and fear insulated and protected me from the outside world. But one day there was a knock on the door. My heart froze, yet everything in me told me that he had come. Once again he knocked. Oh Lord, come in. <coughs> The door opened and there stood an electrician. He wore radiant white overalls and a hat and around his waist was a large leather workman's belt with various tools, wires and light bulbs of different sizes dangling from it. With a softness in his eyes, he came in with a large white ladder into the middle of my dark room. He then proceeded to climb up the ladder and insert a small 25 watt light bulb into the bare socket hanging from the ceiling. He came down, folded up the ladder and left. I crawled into the middle of the soft warm light and I fell asleep. And that healing light began to restore and strengthen me. 
Hours later, I woke and began to walk around the circumference of the light. And then I noticed a shovel lying in the midst of the debris. So I went over and I picked it up <coughs> and I began to clear that area. It was a tremendous amount of work and it took days, but finally it was clean. And then as the days followed, I would find myself lying on my back, just staring at the bare light bulb from the ceiling and loving its light. It had become my friend and comforted me. Then one day there was a knock once again at my door and I knew it was him. I ran to the door and opened it and once again it was the electrician. I ran to the door and opened it and he smiled at me. As he came in, I knew he was pleased with what he saw. He carried his ladder and put it in the middle of the room again, walked <coughs> up it, took out the smaller light and put in a larger 75 watt light bulb. Instantly the light in the room increased and for the first time I noticed a chair and a sofa. I quickly began to discover my newfound space as the electrician folded up his ladder and left. I loved the light. I loved everything about the room. Except then I noticed the piles of dirt hidden everywhere. And then I began to size up the situation. I realized that layers of grime were over piles of old books and papers scattered everywhere. I'd had such an insatiable appetite for things and more and more things, but they had never filled me up. Only the light from the electrician filled that void now. I knew all this clutter had to go, so I rolled up my sleeves and over the next several months began to shovel and sweep and polish. And finally, for the first time in my life, I felt I had a home that was mine. How strange it was because I'd looked everywhere for it and to have it inside me all along amazed me. But then I'd never had the light before. Then one day there was a knock at the door. It sounded similar to the electrician, but I knew it wasn't. I opened it and people who were lovers <coughs> of the light had come to visit me. They loved my home and often came to visit. Then one afternoon as we were all sitting around talking and sharing about all the wonderful things the electrician had done for us, I heard a knock at my door. The electrician had come once again. I ran to the door and opened it a crack. It was him, and he held a large 300-watt light bulb in his hand. I was like, no, no, not now, Lord. No, you can't. Everyone will be watching. I don't want any more light today, not with everyone here. I don't know what it will reveal. I heard the people in my home laughing and talking behind me. But I invited him into my house. Few noticed he was even there, for they were busy amongst themselves. He put up his ladder as usual in the middle of the room and took out the large 300 watt light bulb and screwed it in. As soon as the light came on, it increased the room again until it had tripled in size. There was another sofa, another chair and even a dining room. But just as I'd seen before, dirt was piled up in the once darkened corners. Everyone responded in different ways. A few were shocked at the condition of the house and left, but most stayed and began to grab brooms and shovels and mops and began to help clean the debris. I couldn't believe that they just understood and they accepted me and they loved me just as I was. The electrician came over and embraced me and said, my child, the ones that are staying live in homes that have got even greater light than you do. They also had others help them clean their homes and still do. And that is part of the healing process. Many times things have to be cleared out that are too heavy for one person to carry out. I've made you all to help, heal and restore each other. And then I noticed that around everyone's waist was a workman's belt with wires and light bulbs dangling from it. And as they helped to restore the room, they would put light bulbs into the mended lamps and the light grew and grew. The electrician then said to me, dear one, there are still many rooms in your house that I want to bring my light into. Will you let me? Yes, Lord, I said. My heart responded in surrender. And then he fastened a workman's belt around my waist and said, you will also help to bring light, not only into your own home, but also to light others' lives and hearts. You are my child of the light.